We are 100 days into the Russia-Ukraine war and history may be set to repeat itself. What's happening in Europe may soon be playing out in Asia too. There is a build-up to another conflict. China is practicing the invasion of Taiwan. It is taking lessons from the war in Europe. It is studying Russia's setbacks. Taipei is training its citizens, teaching them how to fight like Ukraine and how to use guns. People are learning how to use a gun in Taiwan. Neighboring Japan is preparing for an escalation in tensions. It is talking with Britain to develop fighter jets. The United States is expanding its military aid to Taiwan. All seems like a deja vu of the days leading up to the war in Ukraine. How long before a similar invasion is triggered in the East? The US has put its finger on a year. Tonight, we'll tell you all about it. Also details of seven developments that could shape the future of India's neighborhood. One hundred days of the Ukraine war, no winners yet. This is a frozen conflict. It may be leading to developments elsewhere, though. Taiwan. Tensions are escalating there. China is making provocative moves. It is sending more ships, conducting more drills. Is China gaming out an invasion? Well, Taiwan certainly is preparing for one. Its citizens are training themselves on how to use a gun. Its allies are pumping in more military aid, and its neighbors are arming themselves with new fighter jets. So is Taiwan the next battleground? That's our cover story tonight. Taiwan is bracing for an invasion. The Pacific is being militarized. There are seven developments that are shaping the future of this region. Let's tell you about them one by one. Development number one, China has provoked Taiwan yet again. Last night, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Army, carried out another round of drills. They conducted nighttime bomber flight training. More than 10 Chinese bombers took off at night. They were equipped with different weapons. They flew from a Chinese base and practiced how to attack. Later, the Chinese press released a statement. Let me tell you how they described this drill. This is from the Chinese press. More than 10 bombers of various types equipped with weapons took off in tandem. They reached the enemy location and simulated missile attack exercises. So China has stepped up its drills and they've been doing so since the Quad Summit. Earlier this week, 30 Chinese jets, 3-0, 30 Chinese jets buzzed Taiwan's air defense zone. It was the PLA's second largest incursion till date and the largest since January this year. These flights are Beijing's favorite option to threaten Taiwan. They're designed to intimidate. China wants to keep reminding Taiwan how easily their military can get to the island. And it's adding more aerial weapons to its arsenal. That's development number two. China wants to develop smart drones. It is taking lessons from Ukraine. PLA researchers are studying Russia's setbacks. They believe that Chinese generals should invest more in drone technology. And we have some statements from their study. Allow me to quote. This is from the PLA's research. As an integrated platform for surveillance and combat, drones speed up the operation of the battlefield kill chain, making the progress of war faster and more flexible than ever. Two quick conclusions here. Number one, China wants drones for surveillance and combat. And number two, they want drones that can bring a swift end to war. Drones with artificial intelligence or AI. How will that work? This is what we've picked up. Chinese soldiers will feed the drone with photographs, pictures of their targets. And these pictures can come from anywhere, from Chinese social media, uh, social media in general, or Chinese spies. The drone will then analyze these pictures. And once it is in the air, the drone will identify, track, and even kill its targets. There won't be any human intervention. Researchers from the PLA suggest these drones can be used to go after quote-unquote, high-ranking officials. Now, who will lead such missions? That's development number three. China is reshuffling its military brass. Some new appointments are in the pipeline. Commanders with deep knowledge about Taiwan are likely to be promoted. Some names are doing the rounds. One of them is Ding Lai Hang. 
He is a commander in the PLA Air Force. Reports say Commander Ding is quote-unquote familiar with the battle plans against Taiwan. He has served in Fuzhou. This is the provincial capital of Fujian in China. Now, Fuzhou is right opposite Taiwan's west coast. So this general, or this commander, knows the lay of the land. Commander Ding is also believed to be close to Xi Jinping. So China is conducting drills. It is looking for more weapons. And it is reshuffling the military top brass. We come back to the question, are they preparing for an invasion? The people of Taiwan certainly seem to think so. Development number four. People in Taiwan are learning how to use a gun. These pictures are from New Taipei. Last week, a training was held here. People from all walks of life participated. They, practices, they practiced how to use a gun. Remember, we saw something similar in Ukraine. Just before the war, civilians had picked up the gun. Many of them are now fighting the war. The people of Taiwan are taking inspiration from Ukraine. They say they want to be ready to fight if China invades. I think that Hong Kong is a really good example. When they took back Hong Kong, they said there would be one country, two systems, without a change for the next 50 years. But only after a few years, it became apparent that, I'm sure that in the beginning, China will use a lot of psychological warfare, saying that Taiwan can remain unchanged. But I don't believe this one bit. Hong Kong is the best example. Also, actually, I have always thought that especially in the recent situation, China will attack for sure. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time, he says. That's what Taiwan fears. It is ramping up its defenses, also projecting strength. Yesterday, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen visited a military base. She was photographed with an anti-tank rocket. Reports say this is an indigenously developed weapon. Plus, Taipei is getting more help from America. Development number five. The U.S. is ready to expand its military aid to Taiwan. That would mean more weapons, more military training and deeper military cooperation. Both sides are making rapid progress. Earlier this week, a U.S. lawmaker visited Taipei. He met with the president of Taiwan. On the same day, President Tsai announced Taiwan's intention to work with the U.S. National Guard. Last July, Senator Duckworth was one of the main sponsors of the Taiwan Partnership Act, which received bipartisan support in U.S. Congress. As a result, the U.S. Department of Defense is now proactively planning cooperation between the U.S. National Guard and Taiwan's defense forces. Senator Duckworth also recently introduced a bill that further prioritizes Taiwan's security as part of U.S. military deployment in the Indo-Pacific region. Taiwan's neighbors are arming themselves too. Japan is worried about China's aggressive posturing. That's development number six. Japan is talking with Britain. They could develop a next-generation fighter aircraft together. They already have an agreement to collaborate on parts for the aircraft. Now discussions are underway to co-develop a fighter jet. Remember, Japan hosted the Quad Summit this time. They have their own concerns about Chinese activities near Taiwan. An invasion of Taiwan will create a direct security challenge for Japan. In fact, during the Quad Summit, China and Russia conducted drills near Japan. They send their bombers. We told you about it. And that should explain why Japan wants new fighter jets. So China's neighbors are arming up and the West is ramping up deployments. Why the urgency? Why are all stakeholders in the Pacific preparing for an invasion now? The answer is development number seven, an American assessment of Chinese plans. The U.S. says it has reason to believe that China could invade Taiwan in this decade. The deadline is set to be 2027. This assessment was recently presented to American lawmakers. The U.S. military believes China is making rapid strides. It is equipping itself with military capabilities to invade Taiwan. The U.S. has made such an assessment before, yes, but this time they're acting on it, responding to Chinese drills, reinforcing their defenses. So we have a mass military buildup in and around Taiwan, and that dramatically increases the threat of war. Any mistake, any misstep could be a trigger. We can only hope there is none. And while Asia braces for conflict, the one in Europe has clocked a new milestone, 100 days. Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February this year. Today is June 3rd. So that's 100 days of relentless fighting. And today everyone has just one question. Who is winning this war? 
I wish I could give you a clear answer, but this war is too hard to predict. It was supposed to be a cakewalk for Vladimir Putin. 100 days on, that's clearly not the case. Having said that, there is slow but gradual progress on the ground. Today, Russia controls 20% of Ukraine's territory. That's around 58,000 square kilometers, about the size of Himachal Pradesh or Uttarakhand. Now, is 20% a lot? Well, that depends on how you look at it. The United States spent 20 years in Afghanistan, but they never beat the Taliban. Most of the Afghan countryside was outside American control. Same in Iraq. U.S. forces camped there for more than a decade, but the insurgency never stopped. So 20% in 100 days is not a bad result, really. Then why does it seem like Russia is stuck? Because the expectations were huge. The Russian blitzkrieg was supposed to take Kiev in days. Instead, Moscow changed strategy. They're not focusing on the capital anymore. They're focusing on the Donbass. And we'll come to that in a bit. But before that, let's look at the cost of these 100 days, the cost of this war so far. First, the human toll. Mariupol alone has reported 21,000 deaths. And those are just civilians. According to President Zelensky, Ukraine is losing 60 to 100 soldiers every day. So that's more than 6,000 soldiers in 100 days. What about Russian losses? The official figure is 1,300, 1,300. But Ukraine claims 30,000 Russian soldiers have died in combat. And if true, that's more than the Soviet toll in Afghanistan. Next, infrastructure. 38,000 residential buildings damaged, 1,900 schools, 500 factories, 500 hospitals. These are figures published by Ukraine. All this carnage has forced people to flee their homes. Around 6.8 million people driven out of Ukraine. 7.1 million internally displaced. This is the cost of 100 days of fighting. But Ukraine is not backing down. Earlier today, President Zelensky released a message on social media. He was on the street again with his cabinet. His message was defiant. Victory will be ours, he says. The armed forces of Ukraine are here, and most importantly, the people. The people of our state are here, defending Ukraine for 100 days already. Victory will be ours. Glory to Ukraine. Which brings us back to the first question. What does that victory look like? You see, every war is fought for political reasons. Putin, too, had a political reason. He wanted to stop Ukraine from joining NATO. Has that goal been achieved? Well, yes and no. Zelensky did talk about agreeing to neutrality. He was also open to discussing the future of Donbass and Crimea. So that's two wins for Russia, neutrality and land. He could get them both. At the same time, there is one major loss. Putin wanted less NATO on his borders. But now Finland and Sweden have applied for membership, which means there will be more NATO on Russia's borders. So right now it's all about cost and benefit. Yes, Ukraine could declare neutrality, but at what cost? What will be the cost to Russia? Sanctions, military setbacks, perhaps even domestic discontent. So Putin has two options now. A, he can escalate the conflict, declare a full war and throw the kitchen sink at Ukraine. Or B, he can use his position to strike a favorable deal. He could get neutrality and land. The first option seems highly unlikely. And I'll give you two reasons why. One, the Russian public are already under immense financial strain. A full war could trigger widespread backlash against Putin. And two, taking Kiev has no strategic value. Putin will have to install a puppet regime. And don't forget, he'll have to fight insurgency. Why bother with all that when Zelensky will agree to the same terms? What happens next in this war will depend on one thing, and that is time. Russia says they're not chasing deadlines in Ukraine, but the fact is that they are. And those deadlines will depend on Western unity. If more sanctions are announced, Russia will face deadlines. They will have to wind up the war quickly. If not, Russia can afford to extend their special military operation, as they call it. And that's what Putin is counting on. Because 100 days in, fatigue is already creeping in. By November, the U.S. will be heading to midterm elections. And President Joe Biden will have to make a choice. Tackle inflation or help Ukraine. Plus, Vladimir Putin is an expert in waging 
such forgotten wars. Think back to the Chechen war from 1999, the Donbass war from 2014, or the Syrian war after 2015. All forgotten and buried by the West. Will this one go the same way? It depends on how distracted the West is. And we can tell you one such distraction is brewing in Syria, possibly a new front in NATO versus Russia. And the trigger is this man, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He wants to invade Syria. As if one invasion was not enough, Erdogan is talking about another one. He wants to create a buffer zone in Syria's north, around 30 kilometers wide. And to do this, he's planning a military incursion. The dates have not been finalized yet, but Erdogan says it could be a sudden attack. Now, why does Erdogan need a buffer zone? For two reasons. A, to drive Kurdish fighters away from Turkey's border, specifically the YPG fighters. The YPG is a key ally of the United States in Syria, but Turkey calls them terrorists, so they want to drive them away. And the second reason is to resettle Syrian refugees. Turkey is currently hosting 3.7 million Syrians. Erdogan's plan is to send them back to this buffer zone, 30 kilometers wide. So that answers the question, why? Next question, why now? For starters, Russia is busy in Ukraine, so chances are Putin cannot spare much for the fight in Syria. Another reason is Erdogan's leverage over the West. I'm talking about NATO's expansion plans. NATO wants to admit Finland and Sweden. But Erdogan is holding up both these memberships. Only he can speed up NATO's expansion. And in return, he could ask for anything, funds, military assistance, or in this case, a green light for the Syrian operation, whatever he wants. Having said that, there will be a backlash, we know. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the move will undermine regional stability. The concern that we have is that any new offensive would undermine regional stability, such as it is, provide malign actors with um, opportunities to exploit instability for their own purpose. We continue um, effectively to take uh, the fight through partners uh, to, uh, to Daesh, to ISIS uh, within Syria, and uh, we don't want to see anything that jeopardizes the uh, efforts that are made to continue to keep ISIS in the box that we put it in. Russia, too, is warning Turkey. Here's what their foreign ministry said, and I'm quoting, We hope that Ankara will refrain from actions that could lead to a dangerous deterioration of the already difficult situation in Syria. Russia is advising against escalation. So both America and Russia are warning Turkey. Neither of them want the operation to go ahead. But will it be enough to deter Erdogan? Let's look at the past. Since 2016, Turkey has launched three operations into northern Syria. Each time, they fought the Kurdish fighters. And each time, they got more territory. So there's no reason to think that Erdogan is bluffing. In fact, this time, he has more reasons to attack. 2023 is election year in Turkey. The economy certainly will not get Erdogan re-elected. Maybe a military operation will. Nationalist voters in Turkey generally support attacks against the Kurds. Also this time, he has insurance. Both NATO and Russia are keen to please him. Just look at the events of today. America's ambassador to the United Nations was in Turkey. Next week, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, will be visiting. The question is, where does this end? Let's assume Turkey does invade Syria. That would pit Russia and Turkey against each other. Every time that happens, there is chaos. And I have examples. 2015, a Russian warplane was shot down by Turkish jets. Ankara claimed the aircraft was flying close to their borders. 2020, Russia and Syria carried out an airstrike in Idlib. More than 30 Turkish soldiers were killed. So Turkey and Russia have a history of fighting in Syria. But here's a new question now. Will NATO get involved this time? They're doing so much for Ukraine after all, which is not even a NATO member. Turkey is. So technically, NATO should be lining up to help Turkey. Why haven't they? Because of two reasons. Number one, Article 5 of NATO covers attacks inside NATO territory. But so far, all attacks have been outside Turkey, in Syria, which is not NATO territory. So collective defense was never activated. Reason number two, the Kurdish groups are key allies of the West. So the United States never approved of Turkey's operations. But this time that could change. If NATO is serious about admitting Sweden and Finland, 
they need Erdogan on board. And if Putin wants Bashar al-Assad on his side, he needs to defend Syrian territory. Neither side may want it. But Erdogan is dragging both of them into a new theater of conflict. We'll be watching this one. Desperate times call for desperate measures, they say. And this is the lesson from our next story, too. The U.S. media is reporting that Joe Biden will be heading to Saudi Arabia, the same kingdom he once vowed to make a pariah. Biden will go there sometime later this month. The trip has not been officially announced yet, but the message from it is loud and clear. It is advantage MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. He's got Biden to salvage ties without saying a word. Flashback to 2018, the assassination of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi planted seeds of discord between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. There was a bipartisan demand to punish Riyadh. But the Trump administration could not afford to do that. Strategic ties were too old and the money coming from arms sales too dear. But Joe Biden said he wanted none of it. Biden promised to put morals over money. He ran for office, swearing to make Saudi Arabia pay the price for murdering Khashoggi. He vowed to make Saudi Arabia a pariah. And he did not shy away from pointing the finger at MBS, the crown prince. Presidential hopeful Joe Biden said, and I'm quoting, Khashoggi was in fact murdered and dismembered, and I believe on the order of the crown prince. It doesn't get more straightforward than this. Now, President Biden is flying down to meet that same crown prince, and that's hardly surprising. Biden needs to do some serious damage control because the war in Ukraine has not left him with any other option. Energy prices are soaring at home and abroad, and Biden must woo Saudi Arabia. The kingdom is not only the world's top oil exporter, one of the top, but also the leader of the global oil cartel, the OPEC. So Joe Biden is heading to Riyadh, with midterm elections just a few months away. He will play all his cards to try and reduce energy prices. But where will this leave his pariah promise? No one's grinning wider than MBS. He did not have to do very much to get Biden to bid goodbye to his morals. All he had to do was one, get the OPEC to increase oil production, and two, ex extend the truce in Yemen. You see, there was already a two month truce in place. This was between the Houthi rebels and the Saudi-led coalition that was fighting them. That truce has been extended. So these were the concessions that MBS made. And before you knew it, American media was abuzz with an upcoming trip to Saudi Arabia. Biden was issuing direct statements in praise of Saudi Arabia, statements like this one. And I'm quoting, Saudi Arabia demonstrated, these are Biden's words, Saudi Arabia demonstrated courageous leadership by taking initiatives early on to endorse and implement terms of the UN-led truce. Does Joe Biden really stand to gain by making this U-turn on his Saudi policy? Not too many months ago, the Biden administration was slapping sanctions against Saudi officials. They were releasing intelligence reports on Khashoggi's murder. As soon as Russia invaded Ukraine, Biden chose to stand down. Sometime in the month of February, White House officials were secretly shipped to Saudi Arabia. It was later confirmed that the visit was intended to, quote unquote, reduce the impact on the global oil marketplace. Biden then reportedly wanted to talk to MBS over the phone. Reports say the Saudis never allowed answered that call. But MBS made, made it a point to send a message to Biden. He gave an interview to an American media outlet, and this is what he said, and I'm quoting. We don't have the right to lecture you in America. The same goes the other way. You don't have the right to interfere in our internal issues. Even if Biden makes some energy gains with his Saudi visit, his political losses will outweigh them. Biden will be paying a political price for his outreach to MBS and for failing to deliver on yet another election promise. And there's a reason I say this. Let's go back to the month of March. The White House was testing waters. There were reports that the president could be traveling to Saudi Arabia. The reaction was overwhelmingly against Biden. The president's own party did not spare him. Activists said the president was aligning with human rights abusers. Alignment or estrangement. It is MBS who gets to win. The Crown Prince made his point by not answering calls from the US. 
and he will be making a point when Biden comes to meet him in his own kingdom. So that's MBS 1, Biden 0. And there's more that he has to worry about, the U.S. president. His son, Hunter Biden, he's creating fresh trouble for the president. A new scandal has hit Hunter Biden. Damaging videos have been discovered on an adult video website. They show Hunter Biden with a sex worker. Allegedly, he was uploading these clips himself. Here's a report. Another scandal is haunting Hunter Biden. A damaging leak is set to embarrass his father, the U.S. President Joe Biden, again. Hunter Biden is believed to have filmed himself with a sex worker. Dozens of such videos were uploaded to the internet, allegedly by Hunter Biden himself. The photographs are from those same videos. These claims have been published by a British tabloid. They say they have accessed Hunter Biden's search history too. The data reveals Hunter Biden's fixation with pornography. In March 2019, he is believed to have visited 281 websites in a span of six days. Out of this, 98 were adult video sites. There are some disturbing search results too. Allegedly, Hunter Biden searched for a tutorial on how to hack a lover's mobile phone. Hunter had a controversial relationship with Halle Biden. She was the wife of Beau Biden, the deceased older son of the president. The search history was allegedly recovered from the same laptop that Biden's son is believed to have abandoned. It was dropped off at a repair shop in Delaware in 2019, but no one took the laptop back. This laptop is the source of several damaging stories against Hunter Biden. Some of the personal and financial data reveal details about Hunter Biden's business links in China and Ukraine. The Republicans have used the same stories as political ammo. They say Hunter Biden's business dealings compromise the US president. Many of these claims have been investigated by American agencies. A federal probe into Hunter Biden's financial affairs is now underway. A series of witnesses have testified before a grand jury in Delaware. These hearings could decide if Hunter Biden will face criminal charges in the future. The White House has kept the president at a distance from his son's public troubles, but the Republicans refuse to let the story die. They want a probe against Hunter Biden if they take back control of US Congress in the midterm election. The next round of revelations will keep the story alive until then. Since we're discussing obsessions and fantasies, how could we not talk about Imran Khan, a man obsessed with power, it seems. So much so that he's ready to see his country disintegrate, ready to see it break into three pieces. This is what he said on Wednesday. 48 hours on, those remarks have led to a storm. The Shehbaz Sharif government is furious. They're mulling a sedition case against Imran Khan. On what grounds? For orchestrating a mutiny, they say. The government of Pakistan says the former prime minister planned an attack on the federation, that he masterminded a rebellion against the state. When did that happen? On the 25th of May, says the government of Pakistan. This is when Imran Khan held the Azadi March. He foot slogged to Islamabad with his supporters. He tried to hold the capital city hostage. The Pakistan government now says this march was an act of treason, that it was meant to create civil strife in the country. So here's what they plan to do. Put Imran Khan on trial for fitna, which means treason. Now this decision was taken on Friday afternoon. A special committee meeting of Pakistan's cabinet was held. The interior minister, the information minister, the communications minister, the law and justice minister, they all met in Islamabad to deliberate the charges. Let me tell you what they said after the meeting. It is likely that action will be initiated against Imran Khan under section 124A of the penal laws that deal with sedition charges. Reports say Imran Khan will not face these charges alone. Giving him company will be two of his comrades. Mahmoud Khan, the chief minister of Khyber Pakhtunwa, and Khalid Khurshid, the chief minister of Gilgit Baltistan. They're both members of Imran Khan's party, PTI. And they're both in the dock. The question is, what does a sedition charge mean in Pakistan? 
life imprisonment, to put it very simply. In some cases, it could also lead to a death sentence. It all depends on what the courts decide. Next question. Have any other Pakistani leaders been tried for sedition? The answer is yes. In 2019, a special court found Parvez Musharraf guilty of high treason. It sentenced him to death for suspending the constitution in 2007. Musharraf did not serve the sentence. He's currently in exile in Dubai. Then in 2020, Nawaz Sharif was booked for sedition. The case was filed by the Lahore police. It accused him of instigating dissent against the Pakistan army. But Sharif could never be put on trial. He was hiding in London. And now with his brother in power, he may never be put on trial, even if he returns. And speaking of the brother, he too has issued a personal warning to Imran Khan. He posted this on Thursday. Allow me to quote. This is the Prime Minister of Pakistan speaking. While I'm in Turkey inking agreements, Imran Niazi is making naked threats against the country. If at all any proof was needed that Niazi is unfit for public office, his latest interview suffices. Do your politics, he says, but do not dare to cross limits and talk about division of Pakistan. Don't cross the limits, says the Prime Minister. This should be his approach to tackling inflation as well. Because inflation in Pakistan seems to be crossing all limits. Look at the headline on your screen. Last month, inflation in Pakistan jumped 13.76%, the highest in more than two years. Foreign reserves, meanwhile, are at their lowest. They've fallen to $10 billion. That's a 50% drop from August 2020. And this money will barely cover two months of imports. More bad news. Ratings agency Moody's has lowered Pakistan's economic outlook from stable to negative. It says the country faces a heightened external vulnerability. What's that supposed to mean? It means that Pakistan faces uncertainty around securing external financing to meet the country's needs. In more sim even simpler words, it will not be able to secure foreign loans to survive. So what should Islamabad prioritize right now? Charging a former prime minister with treason or securing enough funds to stay afloat? The earlier they ask this question to themselves, the better their chances of survival may be. And talking about important questions, here's one that the United States should ask itself. Why can't we ban guns? Every day it's the same headline. Teen goes on a shooting rampage at school. Gunman opens fire at supermarket. Different day, different location, same story. Thursday was no different. There were two gun attacks. One was in Iowa. The gunman shot two women and turned the gun on himself. The second was in Wisconsin. Two people were wounded while attending a burial. Literally nowhere is safe in America. Schools, supermarkets, parks, even churches and burial grounds. Makes you wonder, what is the U.S. government doing? Every time there's an attack, Joe Biden does the same thing. He comes on TV, he criticizes the Republicans, he claims he's helpless, and then he walks off. And on Thursday, he did the same. We need to ban assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks. Enact safe storage law and red flag laws. If only Joe Biden knew someone powerful, someone who is America's head of state and government, someone who directs the federal government, someone who commands the U.S. armed forces. Well, actually, he does. It's Joe Biden himself. The U.S. president cannot pass the buck here. Yes, he needs Congress to implement gun control, but he too can make a difference. Biden could use his vast executive powers. Now, what does that mean? It means that Joe Biden can change the way existing laws are implemented. He cannot make new laws, yes, but he can bolster existing ones. For example, he can use trade policy to control the number of guns on the market. Less gun production, less gun sales. He could also tweak background checks, basically make it harder for people to buy guns. Or he could go after the gun lobby. They spent $15.8 million on lobbying last year, and Biden has done nothing to stop them. So this charade of helplessness has to end. Biden cannot keep kicking this issue to Congress, because let's face it, Congress is not going to implement gun control, and I'll show you why. On Thursday, the House Judiciary Committee held an urgent meeting on guns. Democrats were pushing for gun control, and guess what a Republican congressman had to say on that? Take a look. 
This gun would be banned under this bill. Here's a gun I carry every single day to protect myself, my family, my wife, my home. This is a XL Sig Sauer P365. Comes with a 15 round magazine. Here's a seven round magazine, which would be less than what would be lawful under this bill if this bill were to come law. It doesn't fit. So this gun would be banned. Just a reminder, this week, America is burying 19 school children in Texas, 19 children who were killed with guns. And this so-called lawmaker is waving his gun at a congressional meeting. This is America at its best. Do you know what this episode reveals? A broken system, a system where you see perfection in yourself, but fault in others. Just think about it. Have you heard any world leader talk about this gun menace? Some have condemned it, yes, but not a single one has criticized the American leadership for what's happening there. And do you know why? Because it's easy to judge, but hard to make a difference. It's a lesson that the U.S. is yet to learn. On Thursday, they released their annual report on religious freedoms, a.k.a. their preaching guide. Every country has a separate chapter in this report, every country except the United States itself. Well, here's what the chapter on India says. And I'm quoting, attacks on members of religious minority communities, including killings, assaults and intimidation occurred throughout the year. These included incidents of cow vigilantism against non-Hindus based on allegations of cow slaughter or trade in beef. U.S. officials went a step ahead. They accused the Indian government and its officials of instigating hatred. You have to listen to this. In India, some officials are ignoring or even supporting rising attacks on people and places of worship. India has responded. Its external affairs ministry has rejected this criticism. And I'll read out India's response. It is unfortunate that vote bank politics is being practiced in international relations. We would urge that assessments based on motivated inputs and biased views be avoided. Short but to the point. What gives the United States the authority to judge India? This is a country where people die because of their skin color, where children are shot dead in high school. America should be the last country judging anybody else. So why do they do it? A few months back, India's foreign minister gave some insight. He wasn't speaking about the US, he was speaking about Europe and Asia. But the logic fits perfectly here. Listen to this. No, somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems. But the world's problems are not Europe's problems. That it's, if it is you, it's yours. If it is me, it's ours. I think that's something. Uh, and I see, you know, reflections of that. Classic Western attitude. If India has problems, criticism floods in. It is the sole responsibility of the government, domestic politics, fringe groups. None of those technicalities matter. But if the U.S. has a problem, there is no criticism. Joe Biden happily blames Republicans and the world moves on. How convenient is the system? You make the rules, you enforce the rules, but the rules don't apply to you. Anti-Asian hate crimes in the U.S. are up 339%, 339% up under Joe Biden. And what does the president do? He invites K-pop band BTS to the White House, as if that will magically make things better. It's about time somebody held a mirror to the U.S., because what they see will overwhelm them. Gun terror, racism, anti-Asian hate, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. I could go on. One chapter may not be enough for America. Our next story is about bicycles. It's the 3rd of June, World Bicycle Day, a day to commemorate the existence of this wonderful machine, also to encourage people to take up cycling. But how about we get to know the bicycle a little better? Like when was it invented? How did it evolve over time? What led to the decline in its popularity? And why did the pandemic cause a bicycle boom? We've compiled a report that answers all of this question, all of these questions. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. 
These words by Albert Einstein never fade in relevance, even if the machine they're about has waned in popularity. From being a rage in the 19th century to a mere pastime in the 21st century, from being a symbol of personal mobility to being an emblem of a healthy lifestyle, the bicycle has certainly come a long way. As the world celebrates its existence, let's now take a look at how this vehicle came into being, how it transformed transport and how it is slowly making a comeback. The very first bicycles did not exist until a few hundred years ago. But there are several sketches from the Renaissance era that resemble a device that looks quite like a bicycle. The earliest illustration on record is from Italy. It is attributed to Gian Giacomo Caprotti, an apprentice to the famous Leonardo da Vinci. He drew this sketch in 1534. But it wasn't until the 19th century that the bicycle was actually created. The first confirmed model was made in 1817 by Baron Karl von Drey of Germany. He called it the Lof machine. That's German for a running machine, the first prototype of this machine. It became fairly popular in Germany and spread to many different countries. Inventors in each country worked to improve the design. In 1839, Scottish blacksmith Kirkpatrick Macmillan added pedals to it. In 1864, French inventor Pierre Michaud enlarged the front wheel. And in 1885 came the biggest change. English inventor John Kemp Starley created the safety bicycle. It used the wheel chain drive to assist riders in moving. After this event, bicycles entered their golden age. They became the go-to vehicle that satisfied all aspects of transport. Safety, speed, comfort and steering. The business boomed, the models changed. But with the advent of motorized vehicles, bicycles lost their charm. From a valuable necessity, they became a mode of recreation, a means to improve physical fitness. This remained the norm for much of the late 20th century as well. In 2020, things changed for the better. The bicycle industry witnessed a boom after decades, courtesy the coronavirus pandemic heightened anxiety over public transportation and the desire to minimize virus-related health risks push people back to the bicycle. As we celebrate World Bicycle Day, here's hoping that this trend lasts. It's Friday evening. Before we wrap the show for the week, I have a question for you. Do you know what is sologamy? It's a word many Indians are just learning including myself. Sologamy is the act of marrying oneself, apparently. But who does that? People do. Meet Shama Bindu, all of 24 years old. She claims to be the first Indian to be entering into sologamy. Shama is marrying herself later this month. She says it is the act, the ultimate act of self-love and self-acceptance. Now, in case you don't believe me, we have the wedding card. She did not address it to us, no, but she did share it with the media. Now, everyone's talking about Shama and what she's doing. But here's what the bride-to-be told some reporters, and I'm quoting. I do not require a prince charming because I am my own queen, she says. I want the wedding day, but not the next day. That is why I have decided to marry myself. I will dress up like a bride, take part in rituals, my friends will attend my wedding and then I will come back to my house instead of going with the groom. Interesting. And just to clarify, there is no groom. Shama says her parents are fine with this wedding. What kind of wedding are we talking about? A big fat Indian wedding. There'll be everything from the priest to the rituals, everything minus the groom. You may call it bizarre, you may call it sad, you may call it attention seeking, and you may not even be wrong. But the fact is, sologamy is now a thing. People are marrying themselves everywhere. In 2017, a woman in Italy invited her friends to a lavish wedding. She was dressed in a dream gown. There was a three layer wedding cake, but there was no groom. That woman too said she did not need a prince for a fairy tale wedding. And it's not just women who are exchanging vows with themselves. In 2020, a Brazilian man married himself. He was actually supposed to marry his fiancée, but she broke off the engagement. And by then, the wedding preparations were done. A coastal resort had been booked. 
and payments upwards of $61,000 had already been made, so the heartbroken man decided to stand in front of the guests, hold up a mirror and say a yes to himself. How dramatic. Quick question. Are such ceremonies even legal? Well, they aren't. In India, a marriage must be between two persons, individuals. It's the same elsewhere, which makes sologamy merely symbolic, meaning it is not a real marriage. How could it be? But people seem to be okay with this. They aren't just marrying themselves. Some are even divorcing themselves. I'm not making up any of this. Like this woman in Brazil, she decided to call it quits just 90 days after marrying herself. Apparently, she'd found someone else. <laughs> this industry does not mind the celebration of self-love. Companies around the world are offering sologamy services. A Japanese company is offering a two-day sologamy package. In Canada, a wedding company has an all inclusive package. It also covers photography. There are similar companies in the United States. Just Google Sologamy and you will be surprised to see how much of the conversation there is around self-marriage. Critics have spared no words to slam this idea. Lawyers are calling out the pointlessness of it. Therapists say it's loneliness that's driving people to do this. But the ones who have entered into such a marriage have nothing but heartfelt stories to share. Here's what one sologamist writes. In our culture, everyone blindly applauds you when you announce you are in a relationship. But you don't get nearly the same reaction when you decide to focus on your relationship with yourself. In fact, everyone treats you with unspoken sympathy when you're single. Don't worry, love. The right man is just around the corner. Well, I decided it was time to rejoice in my wholeness. And what better way to celebrate self-love than with a wedding? So from what I gather, sologamy is not saying I'm never marrying. It's about breaking the taboo around spinsterhood and saying that I'm happily single at 30 or 40. The first recorded instance of sologamy was reported in 1993. That's how far back it goes. A woman put on a white dress and married herself just ahead of her 40th birthday. During the ceremony, the bride was reminded the only thing missing was a quote-unquote beer-swilling couch potato who might forget your birthday. <laughs> the non-minister then asked her, do you solemnly swear to be good to yourself, to honor yourself in sickness and in health until the day you're not here? I do, said the bride. I understand there are many questions in your head right now. But I will end with a reminder, at the end of the day, it's to each his own. So we wish all the best to this 24-year-old from India. Let's take a look at what else is making news across the world. This is Gravitas Global Headlines. Turkey's inflation climbs to its highest level since 1998, hitting an annual 73.5% in May, an issue troubling President Erdogan ahead of elections next year. A demonstration in Kenya against the threats posed by wildlife turned deadly as security forces killed four protesters. The protesters blocked the Nairobi-Mombasa highway for hours, using rocks and burning tires, which led to police intervention and fatal shootings. Multiple people were shot during a funeral in Racine, Wisconsin on Thursday, as people were paying final respects to a 37-year-old man. The shooting came a day after a gunman killed his surgeon and three other people at a hospital in Oklahoma. South Korea is all set to lift its quarantine requirement for foreign arrivals who have not been vaccinated against COVID-19 from June 8th. It will also start lifting aviation regulations imposed on international flights, but the government will maintain the requirement of a negative PCR test result prior to entry and a PCR test within 72 hours after arrival to keep a check on incoming travelers. In Sudan, police used tear gas to disperse protesters who took to the streets of the Sudanese capital of Khartoum on Thursday, ahead of the third anniversary of a crackdown on mass protests in which dozens of peaceful protesters were killed. 
French diplomats went on a strike in front of France's foreign ministry, protesting the government's new plan to merge career diplomats with other civil servants. This policy will bring diplomats at the same level as other bureaucrats, and they will have to compete with civil servants from other fields for coveted diplomatic posts. Japan reports a record low number of births in 2021, prompting the biggest ever natural decline in the population, according to the government data. According to a new study, the Snow White Alps are increasingly turning green due to the impact of global heating as visible from space. With that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.